uh, the recording now and uh, we will we should slowly start uh, welcome everyone um, let me just uh, post uh, a note about translation into our chat um, Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we are very privileged uh, to have uh, Alpa Shah here with us today. Um, among other books and publications, Alpa is the author of The Night March, uh, a book that she's going to talk about today. Uh, this is a book about Naxalites. India's Revolution League Guerrillas. The book was shortlisted for the Orwell Prize for Political Writing and received uh, other awards. Uh, she is an associate professor reader in anthropology at the, the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, Alpa is committed to public engagement and has reported and presented for BBC Radio 4 uh, and the World Service and also curated a major photo exhibition behind the Indian boom. Uh, as for the topic uh, of today's discussion, uh, it, is, it is a great reminder, I think, that post-university uh, is not simply one of those places for endlessly recursive reflection about uh, what pile of crap we are all in as academics and citizens and, and, and how we got there. It is not merely a place for self-pity. Uh, it is a community of practice. Um, uh, we invite and actually do thinking and research on various topics that are not immediately related to academia, but are adjacent to it, uh, as they involve states, minorities, worldviews, the problem of access, uh, etc. We, we have them listed on our website if, in case you are interested. Uh, at the same time, we are also thinking of uh, how to do this differently in a way that is, that is less arrogant and, and more comprehensible for, for everyone around. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, Alpa's work is a, is a perfect example of how this can be done. Uh, when, when I first read the, the Night March, I was uh, blown away completely and decided that if, if in my own work, I will always, uh, if I, that I decided that in my own work, I will always strive towards trying, at least trying to write like that, even if uh, completely hopelessly. But I think uh, a more indicative would be a reaction of, uh, of a friend of mine who I shared the book with and who has nothing to do with academia. You know, she's uh, an IT specialist and uh, um, has gone to university many, many years ago. And uh, uh, without, you know, I didn't ask her anything. She just wrote me and I quote here, uh, I read the night march. Uh, this is an extremely interesting and, and sad story. Are you still looking for a publisher to publish a translation of the book, which I still am, by the way? Uh, who did you write to already? I'm ready to help with what I can and to contact more people. So I think that this is a great example of actually reaching out. This is a great example of uh, uh, connecting people, real people with their real lives, with their real jobs, with their real everything. Uh, and uh, uh, that is why I think uh, all of us are going to enjoy today's lunch with Alpa Shah. Without further ado, I'm passing the floor to you, Alpa. Uh, please, uh, everyone, uh, use the chat option um, to ask questions uh, and uh, stay tuned. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Anatoly, um, for this extremely generous um, introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very touched and also to have um, had you reaching out after you read the book uh, some years ago and, and uh, well, not that long ago, actually, a little while ago. Uh, and um, yeah, the, 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 the enthusiasm um, that people like you have shown towards it. Um, the book was only possible because of the support that I received uh, throughout my, you know, um, life, I guess, or throughout my, at least my academic life from colleagues in Indian universities. Um, and, um, you know, it's a very, very uh, sad time right now uh, in India to see the kind of um, spaces of 
academic freedom or freedom generally to dissent, to discuss, to debate, being closed down uh, entirely. Um, so I think it's so important that, um, you know, what you are doing uh, in this post-university gathering to bring together people to create alternative spaces to discuss what the university is about, you know, what knowledge should be about and to uh, provide platforms beyond the kind of stifling that is going around uh, across the world. And I think that what you're doing uh, right now will also provide a great inspiration uh, to a lot of colleagues and scholars in India. Um, what I want to do today is, I guess I want to share with you some of this Indian story, what is happening to the university um, and to academic freedom, to debate, to discussion in India. And I want to do that through um, telling the story or the kind of post story of my book, Night March. Uh, recently, I was asked to write a new preface um, by Harper Collins, who is the Indian publisher of the book, um, for the paperback that they're about to release in October. So um, I wrote something which is quite different to the actual book itself, which is a kind of nuanced account of why people have joined uh, a, an armed revolutionary Marxist-Leninist movement in India, which has been raging for the last kind of 50 years. Um, you know, the kind of hopes and desires of people to change the world, but also a story of how uh, they fall apart. Uh, so this, this, the book itself is, is, um, is my story of, um, I guess, this movement, its history, and it's based on very long-term field research in one of its guerrilla zones, uh, living amongst the indigenous people of India, the Adivasis. But what I want to do now um, is to present to you uh, this uh, preface to Night March, which at the moment uh, is, yeah, it's not yet published. So I'm sharing with you um, something that will be in the public domain in the future. Um, but I think it's, this is the most appropriate place uh, to, to share it. And uh, I'm really feel privileged to, to be able to do that with you and to maybe have these discussions about what it all means and what can be done, um, uh, that big question. Uh, okay, so I'm mainly going to, um, yeah, um, read and show you some pictures as well. Uh, so let me just share um, my screen before I begin. Okay, um, there we go. Am I, is it working? Am I sharing it with you? Yeah, great, okay. And can you hear me okay? Is it? Is the sound okay? Okay, good. Okay, so um, this is called um, Unlocking the Nation or Unlock the Nation. Now, India is on the road to creating a giant prison. A countrywide lockdown was called in March this year, March 2020, but the forces of the Indian state have been locking away ordinary people's lives for years. The regime in power today is accelerating along a path that previous governments have paved. It brings anti-democratic measures which parallels with parallels across the world from Brazil to Turkey and of course in Hungary too. A lethal mix of authoritarianism and neoliberal reforms is on the rise which is benefiting big business but it's brutally curtailing many people's freedoms, dispossessing them of their livelihoods and sharply escalating inequalities. So what I will do today is present to you this new preface uh, to the paperback edition of Night March to share with you what I have seen uh, in India, for I think it has relevance for all of us. I saw the imprisonments first happening in the heart of the country, in the forests that are home to the Adivasis, India's indigenous people. I'm just trying to share with you my next slide, but I'm not sure how to do that. Do I? Oh, there we go. Yeah. There, in the heart of the country, the state security forces surrounded the Adivasi hills and forests. They occupied their schools and their health centers. They ran riot in their villages. 
If the locals had not already fled when their homes were burnt down, they were labeled terrorists. They were promised their freedom only if they surrendered it first and otherwise locked in jails. I am told in the state of Jharkhand, which is the state where I did a lot of my research, there alone there are more than 4,000 Adivasis who are in prison as alleged Naxalites or Maoist extremists, and they're kept without even being produced for trial. In the villages where I lived as an anthropologist, everyone has tales of the wounds of police torture they have faced, they have witnessed or they have helped heal. The ones I have heard about include electric shock treatment, they include branding with hot iron rods, they include thrashings with people being hung upside down with their legs and hands tied. Others have been disappeared and then presented later in some forest, apparently killed in an encounter. These are India's famous or infamous encounter killings, or they've been simply declared dead in custody. Now, this is not an unusual story in India. In 2019, the National Human Rights Commission has reported that 1,723 people about five a day die in police custody in India. Over the years, the people I lived, many of them, the Adivasis, they migrated away to far away places they, to escape the horrors back at home. They joined the precarious armies of invisible workers who are constructing cities in Tamil Nadu, paving roads in the Himalayas, or carrying bricks on their heads and shoulders in West Bengal. They poured their energy, they poured their sweat, their laughter and their tears into laying the foundations of a brand new India that ultimately they would be kept out of. Underpaid and overworked, uprooted by labor legislation, often tied to labor contractors, they lived in slum colonies in conditions almost as bad as that of their kin who are in prison. That is until the lockdown was announced. Indians, Indians were given just four hours by Prime Minister Narendra Modi to prepare for a regime that would keep people hold in their homes unfolding what many have said is the greatest humanitarian crisis of the last 50 years. At that point, with no way to feed themselves, Adivasis, as many others, had little option but to defy the new order and march back to their forests. When they got there, those who had not returned for several years found their, found their villages occupied by military barracks. For those leading the country, Adivasi lands are simply a vast treasure of mineral reserves that need to be freed from the dark jungles above, the jungles which are inhabited by savage people who must be tamed, civilized, and chained to work for the nation, or who must perish. These are the stigmas against Adivasis, and they are widely held. Even in Ranchi City, well-meaning, educated friends who had lived there for decades were ad adamant that it was too dangerous for me to live in the mud huts on their doorstep. Visit the villages in the daytime in a four-wheel drive wheeler with a driver if you must, they said, but return to the city by dusk, they advised. The darkness brought wild elephants and Naxalites, but also the threat of the people, they said, allegedly seeking to protect me. I was told that Adivasis are some of the poorest people on earth, but in the years that I lived with their communities, the people who became my uncles and aunts showed me a world of infinite riches, one where women roam the forests and fields at their will quite unusual in India, where, women, where men often cooked and cleaned and where children spent all day swinging on lianas, rolling wagon wheels of hay and feasting on wild berries. A place where individual autonomy and creativity were valued without a need to rise above the rest. 
The Adivasis I lived with helped each other to make their picturesque villages from mud, dung and timber around them. They built beautifully carved teak doors, artfully painted walls with their fingers using white mud and they molded and baked their roof tiles, which unlike the commercial ones, kept their houses cool in the summer and warm in the winter and on which the rain made music. They wove their sleeping mats from reeds, their baskets from bamboo, and they made cups and plates for, for, for parties for, from sal leaves, so leaves of a tree. Their cuisine, which was a product of foraging from, for hundreds of different varieties of flowers, leaves, and mushrooms, hunting wild meat and distilling wine made from the mahua flour would amaze any a Michelin star chef. Leaving only a bare trace of their presence, their negligible ecological imprint and their de democratic practices made these Adivasis visionaries of our future. Yet, these indigenous people have been under constant assault from outsiders who have seen them as fossils of our past and have sought to develop and colonize them while robbing them of their land, their flora and their fauna. From freely roaming the terrain, British colonial rule forced them into permanent settlements to extract revenue. They sold their trees as timber for the building of railways and military ships, and they took the land from under their feet for the excavation of coal, iron ore, and bauxite. Adivasis fought back, but their bows and arrows were no match for the cannons and muskets fired at them but they did secure a bare minimum protection to retain some access to their land, forests and water to live on their own terms. Yet despite these protections, it has been a losing battle to try to keep at bay the national and multinational corporations who today, aided and abetted by the state, are stealing Adivasi lands and forests, perpetuating some of the worst human rights abuses and creating what is now one of the world's most unequal countries. Now, protesting against these inequalities, the Naxalites, these um, Marx, Lenin and Mao inspired revolutionaries marched into these forests and the hills from the agricultural pains. They were looking actually for better guerrilla terrain. Uh, they were leading a protracted people's war to, that was going to move from the countryside in kind of classic Maoist um, style tactics that was going to move from the countryside uh, into the cities to take over the state. They said they were fighting the injustices faced by the Adivasis and that they would bring about a more equal communist world. But if for centuries, colonial and independent India's ideas of progress had failed to value the Adivasi world, so too, sadly, did these insurgents. The Naxalites saw the traditional lives of the Adivasis as doomed to the dustbin of history, as people who must be developed to be fit for the new communist world. Indeed, if the Hindutva, this is the right wing um, forces who are now spreading in the areas, treat the Adivasis as backward Hindus to be made into proper Hindus, the Naxalites saw them as primitive communists to be turned into real communists. So though these two forces are so commonly opposed as being right wing and being left wing, and though of course there are very important differences between them, over the course of Night March, the book, um, what is also revealed is some of the similarities in their puritanism, their renunciation and their patriotism. In the pages of Night March, there is much to criticize the Naxalites, but it is also clear that these are no anti-nationals as they have now been portrayed. No Desh Virodi, that's what they're called in India, people. But they love India just as much as the followers of Hindutva say they do though they have very different ideals about its future. Now, by the, at, by the end of my last night, uh, on my seven night march, so night march is framed around a seven night march with a guerrilla platoon moving from one cup part of the country to the next, one finds that even a decade ago, their People's Liberation Guerrilla Army was already reduced to a ragtag bunch they had to continuously perpetually move 
through the night to survive. They were rarely able to even rest a day or two, and even in the most remote parts of the country. The state counterinsurgency forces, whether it was like the Central Reserve Police Forces or all of these specially trained um, counterinsurgency forces that the Indian state have created with names like the Jharkhand Jaguar or the Cobra or the Greyhound. These forces do dominated the terrain with their armaments, infiltrated with their spies and their patrols and the ter territories that the Naxalites felt safe in dramatically shrunk. But amongst the guerrillas in night march, you will you find Adivasi youth who, were flit who flitted in and out of the guerrilla armies as though they were going to stay with an uncle or an aunt, like my bodyguard Kohli, who had sought refuge with the Naxlites after a fight with his father. There are also young Adivasi men who had actually very ordinary desires, like Vikas, uh, one of another central character of Night March, who had, you know, a flashy phone full of soft porn, a fine house and a large car, and who had been secretly stealing money away from the guerrillas and who eventually actually came to betray the guerrillas. But there were also these very highly educated, um, you know, people, people who had degrees from universities, even PhDs, high caste leaders um, like Gyanji, another central character of the book, who had been underground for 20 years or more, who had actually broken with their past, who had sacrificed their entire life to make a more equal world. Yet these people too didn't think that the relative egalitarianism that already existed among the Adivasis, such as the relationship between men and women, could be worked with for their new world, inadvertently leading to a decline of those values amongst the Adivasis. The Naxalite, the leaders were aging, ailing, and they knew that their movement needed revitalization, rejuvenation, and reform, even while they held on to a party strategy and tactics as though it were a kind of religious text. So what I'm trying to say is that this next light struggle was already falling apart from within. But in the years after I left those forests, the military fight against them actually not only escalated, but the idea was spread that these extremists, these revolutionaries, these um, insurgents were everywhere, not just in remote parts of the country, but right in the heart of Indian cities. Reports of urban Urban Naxals increasingly appeared. Those attacked were human rights activists, reporters, and intellectuals. They were people who had variously called into question the, atro the atrocities against minorities carried out by police forces. They, had, they were the people who had worked to protect the rights of the vulnerable from the assault of corporate capital and had kept open the spaces of intellectual freedom and democratic critique. Labeling somebody as an urban Naxal allowed them to be charged with sedition and with offenses under the dreaded Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, which makes bail nearly impossible. Now, thousands of people were affected such that by, by 2018, social media at one point was trending with people claiming to be Me Too urban Naxal. This was a way of people protesting against the ever expanding number of scholars and activists who were being targeted as Naxalites in an attempt to silence them. Now, it seems quite ironic that though through such upsurges in a country that is so often called the world's largest democracy, state repression is inadvertently leading to the idea of Naxalism keeping alive the idea of democracy itself. In the latest round of state-led assaults, which actually began in 2018, now infamously called the Bim Corridor case, the police threw into prison internationally well-known lawyers, human rights activists, poets, and scholars they said that they were involved in a Naxalite plot to, to assassinate the Prime Minister Modi. Those inc incarcerated included the Cambridge-educated trade union activist and advocate Sudha Bardwaj. There you see a picture of her right there um, in the sari. 
um, you, you, there was also the journalist, democratic rights activist and writer Gautam Nervlako is above, above Suda there, and the Dalit intellectual Anand Teltunde, who is right at one end of the, on the, of the, of the pictures. All of these people um, had been invited as our academic guests at the London School of Economic and Political Science to help set new agendas from below for research on inequality. Meaning to say, these are, these are people who are internationally well known for their work. Now, the evidence supplied against these Beam Koregao, um, uh, uh, um, uh, Peep, Beam of Korogao, um 12, uh, as, they, as they were popularly called, in fact, the numbers are now increasing, um, is for actually flimsy. Their trials will last years, even if finally they will be acquitted. It is said that in India, the legal process itself is the punishment. It works to break up the human spirit. Moreover, these people have been incarcerated at a time when COVID-19 is running through overcrowded jails. States across the world are following advice from the hum United Nations human High Commissioner for Human Rights, who has demanded the release of prisoners, prioritizing political prisoners to prevent catastrophic rates of infection. Yet amongst those who are incarcerated is also the 80-year-old poet Varvara Rao, who has flailing health, who is delirious in prison now, having contracted COVID-19. Please, please for his release from family members, internationally respected scholars. There's been a huge, you know, huge international support from academics all over the world. Um, for all of these uh, uh, people who have been incarcerated, have been totally ignored. This is a time when such incarcerations will amount to capital punishment without trial. Such callous targeting of an internationally well-regarded middle-class intelligentsia seems actually nothing but a means of sending a warning to everyone that the state's forces are not only hidden in the forests, where their rampage can be ignored by most, but that they can reach anyone's home at any time unless they fall in line. So this seems above all a method of instilling fear that any form of public dissent, protest or expression of difference with the current regime's policies will be silenced. Be quiet or you're next. In the pages of Night March unfold a measured, nuanced, even unexpected account of the spread of the Naxalites. Unveiled are the complicated and contradictory all too human motivations of those who join, the beauties and fragilities of their existence, the love and the betrayals at the heart of those who come together in this movement to change the world. But now, today, you know, these last months, writing this preface amidst an escalation of state repression and authoritarianism, knowing that a movement that had already been ravaged 10 years ago is being used as part of the wider repression to silence the country at large, I take here uh, in this presentation and in the preface, the new preface to the book, a different tone. It seems to me critical that as part of a wider attempt to keep alive the spaces of democracy, for me as a scholar, an overseas Indian, and a citizen of the world, to internationally draw attention to how the issues at the heart of Night March have become some of the most significant in closing democratic spaces in India today. Alongside the targeted repression of internationally well-known scholars, actually come a whole range of other anti-democratic measures. So whatever freedom, little freedom the press had is, for instance, increasingly being strangled. For the last 12 years, India has appeared as one of the 13 countries on the Global Impunity Index, which documents places where journalists are murdered and their killers go free. There is too the everyday harassment of reporters, with the lodging of first information reports against those who highlight a story that the powers would be would rather hide. There's the vanishing of news reports that show them in poor light. In the two months between the announcement of the COVID-19 lockdown and the end of May 2020, 
55 journalists faced arrests, registration of FIRs, summons or show cause notices, physical assaults, alleged destruction of properties and threats. Self-censorship of everyone, including the press, appears to be the goal. The deeper target is actually our ability to think and what we can think about with the purpose of establishing a Hindutva version of society which explicitly demonizes Muslims who are about 200 million people who are rightful citizens of the Indian nation. Just as the Hindutva forces have asserted their influence across the country's institutions, so too have they sought to dominate the organization of education. So take, for example, public universities, where which were you know, once imagined as actually sanctuaries of the inner life of the nation, a place where everything would be brought to the test of reason. So the place where I had the privilege of holding two visiting fellowships, two research partnerships, Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU as it is, as it is called, renowned as one of the country's premier higher learning institutions with a rich environment of debate, deliberation and discussion was by 2016 painted as a hotbed of Maoism, a hotbed of Naxalism, where students were being indoctrinated into anti-national activities. Under the new vice chancellor, who was handpicked by the government, new regimes of control were introduced. For faculty, there were daily attendance regist registers, promotion of only those who would not challenge the administration's diktats, control of se selection committees for appointing new staff. Meanwhile, protesting students were charged with sedition. Staff and students fought back against the changes meant to imprison the minds of new generations and curtail the production of thinkers, writers and dreamers. But the attack on the university escalated such that by the end of last year, 2019, the police either led or were complicit, or, or were actually complicit um, in the violence that was being unleashed against dissenters. Here you see students at JNU. In the aftermath of um, the 2019 Citizenship Amendment Act, which actually sanctioned in law, religious discrimination to specifically target Muslims, peaceful, peaceful protesters were brutalized on campuses. At Jamia Millia Islamia University in Delhi, there was video footage of the police attacking with baton students sitting quietly in libraries, blinding others with tear gas. Students were detained, others were jailed. Um, ironically, um, these these included women who, were, who had formed a movement called the Pinja Todd, which literally meant breaking the cage. Though in fact, they had very ordinary demands such as removing onerous restrictions on the mobility of women who were residents of hostels. Now, um, particularly chilling is how some youth are being raised, raised to hate their neighbors and incite hate. At JNU earlier in 2020, uh, a masked mob who was chanting anti-Naxal and na Naxalites, uh, anti-national and Naxalites, were beaten with armed rods, uh, iron, iron rods, sledgehammers, sticks and, and bricks, beaten, stu students and staff were, were all beaten who had been protesting against the raising of student fees. Eyewitnesses have said that the vigilantes leading these attacks were from the Hindutva student wing. So it's not just the humiliating treatment of fellow students or their lower caste tribal and Muslim brothers and sisters, which is frightening, but that they are being encouraged to take pride in this brutality. They have no shame in circulating the videos of their lynchings, of parading around those who have, they have beaten, beaten with garlands of shoes hanging around their necks or saying to their friends, next time, kill them. This cruelty shown to fellow human beings as though they were a different inferior species belongs to the era of apartheid South Africa or racial segregation in the US, not to 21st century India. Crimes are being committed which neither time nor history will forgive. Crimes which have destroyed and are destroying millions of lives. 
And that all evidence points to the fact that the global crisis caused by the unprecedented worldwide COVID-19 pandemic are exacerbating injustices and inequalities. Yet it is also a moment to dissent against the multiple incarcerations to create a more equal, more just, more humane planet. India is a crucible for a wider set of battles taking place in many parts of the world, whether it is the US, Russia or Hungary. Everywhere we see the violent dispossession of indigenous people from their homes for the extraction of natural resources by state-backed corporations. We see police brutality, the repression of democratic rights and the spread of authoritarianism. But we also see the persistence of insurgent action with multiple motivations, modes and contradictions. We see people fighting back, back whether it is in the Black Lives Matters movement in the US or the student protests across India, or in indeed what is this post-university environment that is being created here right now. This is a moment to set a new global standard to truly make India into the world's deepest democracy, not just its largest. It's a time to unlock the country, the people, their livelihoods and their imagination in a larger and more meaningful way than simply easing the lockdown. So what I'm trying to do um, here and in this book uh, is to, to, uh, to understand some of the issues um, that are at stake, to know the people whose lives cannot be erased and whose dignity stands tall despite all the efforts to the contrary. We must join hands with the dissenters and start by freeing those who are caged in the overcrowded prisons. We must unlock the forests from the security forces and the corporations and return them to the people who have lived there for centuries as part of a broader move to enable a decent livelihood for all. And we must encourage critical thought, debate and discussion to flourish in the country's educational institutions as a step to nurturing free minds everywhere. Dissent is not only central to democ democracy, it is what makes us humans. So I end the preface by making a plea to freeing India. It's not yet too late. Thank you. For <clears throat> thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Alpa, for, for this, this wonderful talk, this, this uh, troubling talk and, and also a compassionate one. Uh, I would like to open the floor to, to the questions, to reactions uh, from the audience now. Give it a few more seconds before I ask my. Please feel free to ask whatever mm. you'd like to ask, uh, <laughs> or even any thoughts, any any anything you want to yeah. share from your own experiences. Yeah. It would be great for me to hear. Unfortunately, I have been crushed by <laughs> my own responsibilities in the university, unable to join yeah. most of the rest of the session. So I'm very interested yeah. to hear also the parallel conversations that have been going on. Like you wrote earlier that uh, the university prevented you from joining the, the, the post-university, <laughs> the, the irony of the day. The yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so long as uh, many of us here are from, from the university, uh, that that university, which is uh, which is in crisis today, and which is trying to do something um, with uh, with ourselves, uh, I was just uh, wondering because I think that your work uh, is is a great example of uh, um, how to change the situation, the, the the one that we are unhappy with, uh, by means of uh, actually big projects like like important books, like something which uh, requires a lot of time and effort. Uh, from from an academic, uh, and uh, in fact, can uh, uh, only be afforded by by those who are in a position to to be able to do that. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, as as you probably uh, are aware, uh, the, there are plenty of academics and plenty of people working in in the university system, and uh, plenty of uh, uh, people who are interested in knowledge production who uh, are <laughs> over overworked and underpaid, just like uh, uh, just like many people in the world, and uh, who sometimes cannot afford um, uh, acting big 
and uh, going for for big projects. And I was wondering whether uh, you have any ideas or thoughts on uh, whether it's possible and if it is possible, how it is possible to actually um, bring about the change that you're talking about or start moving in that utopian direction by, uh, by, the, by way of small deeds and what those small deeds could be in our everyday experiences, in our everyday lives. Oh gosh, this is such a huge um, question and one that it is impossible to have any one answer for or any answer to really but i i um i fully recognize what you highlight you know which is that it's not many of us that have the privilege of having the time and the space to embark on such journeys as i did in night march and in fact the very systems that are crushing us in some ways have enabled me to do that <laughs> you know i mean that uh, you know the research uh, you know, my time from the university had to be bought out um, um, by um, by a research grant, which probably is part of the same body of um, uh, of educational um, bureaucracy, which is also now uh, you know creating all kinds of reform, which mean that we have to. Um, publish only really for uh, our peers, not for the wider world that ranks our publication, you know, the neoliberalization of the university, right? It's, it's everywhere. And it's also, it, it, you know, the kind of book like uh, a book like Night March, it's, um, uh, uh, it's actually very hard to write uh, in the university environment right now, where, you know, a certain kind of scholarly production has taken over where basically academics just write for each other. So writing Night March was actually, you know, very much against the grain of everything that, you know, I was being advised to do in my, in, in the university. Um, so, um, you know, so, so even for those of us who have the privilege of having the space to do this kind of research, to write a book like, um, like Night March is actually extraordinary, extraordinarily difficult, you know, so it's, you know, books, people who write books like this, you know, books like this will not do, you know, will probably not count for promotions, will not be, um, you know, will not be counted for uh, in the way um, that one would hope for uh, all the research evaluation exercises that are, that we are now monitored by. Um, and on, you know, and that, so on the one hand, that freedom gives you that space, but even that space, you know, you have to kind of fight against what, against the pressures that are put on that space. Meanwhile, probably, you know, what happened is somebody else uh, who is on a contract position comes to do my teaching and what kind of possibilities are there for, for, for you know, people who are, as you say, you know, operating on so many um, short-term positions who don't have the freedom or the space to even, you know, um, even write actually, you know, some of my colleagues, you know, it's like teaching is such a big, um, uh, you're taken over by teaching an admin and 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 there is little space to do research or or, or writing um i i mean I, you know i feel that all the small measures that one undertakes are super important including in teaching you know we still have the freedom to think about what it is that we teach about in many parts of the world you know not you know in india you see the repression is at an, another level so even you know educating students i mean what how we teach what we teach uh um I think it is extraordinarily extraordinarily important um I think that or you know solidarity with our with our friends um in in such positions creating spaces like the one you're creating is, is super important um uh it, yeah it, it I mean, for me, I think that um, the question of alliances, uh, people doing what they can in the situations they're in, but then the formation of alliances, trying to um, create a space, as much space for each other by forming alliances with each other is, 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 really, is, is really important in this moment in time. Um, the tragedy of uh, so much of the dissent or, or, or um, especially in the left, I mean, from, I learned from the left in India is um, the factions uh, that form or with, you know, different parts of the system, different part, different people, um, different groups having different agendas. 
and then actually it's the inner fighting be between people that actually should be allies <laughs> that is um you know that that it, that is that is one of the biggest tragedies um uh or ha you know historically uh, of uniting against um uh, against repression uh and authoritarianism so um i think that right now one of the biggest challenges is recognizing what we can all you know it's not everybody has to write big books like night march everybody doesn't have to do that kind of research but it's recognizing you know what people can do in their particular environments and creating forces of alliances in in those in those places um yeah i i don't you know um such a general general answer i don't you know i don't know if it answers your question at all or if it helps in any way but yeah Thank you, thank you, thank you, Alba. As you were as you were speaking, I was uh, you know I was having this thought that you know that being put in a position, uh, being uh, being put in a position of having to write uh, for your for your peers only or into your desk, is this very sort of curious form of, of discipline and, and, and oppression that that is of course uh, more visible in the parts of the world where where uh, where power works more directly but uh, it is still present in other parts of the world where it works in a sneaky way all right so uh i would like to invite our audience uh, again to to ask questions to make their comments to uh to raise concerns uh jackie yes please go ahead Hello, uh, Alpa, thank you for your talk. Uh, Anatoly, I'm helping to co-organize this event and Anatoly has always spoken very highly of you and so I'm really happy to have heard you uh, speak. So thank you for joining us. But I wanted to ask a question about something that I think is really interesting and maybe not really discussed much, at least um, in my circles or you know something like this, which is India's um, internet shutdowns and how prevalent this is in Indian political space and how this affects organization and things like this. And you mentioned how, for instance, post-university is something that has taken advantage of this kind of internet space. And we've also heard already in some of the other talks about Russian and Turkish initiatives that also have taken advantage of this kind of internet space and treating it more as a space that they can find freedom where they might not be able to find it in their um, physical space. So my question for you is how is kind of the internet understood in India in terms of treating it, whether treating it, it doesn't have to be an either or, but in my mind the question is kind of does, does it give this promise of a free space or does it already feel restricted? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really, um, it's a really important question um, because um, it raises the questions of the limits of the possibilities of the internet. Um, yeah, you're completely right. So there have been, um, uh, to highlight the problem actually, because there have already been uh, total blockouts of internet uh, in situations when the state really uh, didn't want people to, news to get out. So in Kashmir, for example, uh, with, um, you know, after the recent article was passed, which basically enabled India to um, remove the special privileges that Kashmir had had, um, there was complete blockout of the internet. So people couldn't get news of, you know, family and friends who were there, journalists couldn't report out. Um, and these kinds of partial blackouts have been used in a number of different um, scenarios. So firstly, the state has obviously got complete, um, you know, possibility of, of controlling, controlling that. Um, secondly, um, uh, people are, I think, also very wary now uh, of, uh, you know, things like Twitter or WhatsApp or, you know, social media, because what is said on social media, um, A, um, can very easily be used against you uh, um, and, and is being used, you know, so people are being um, uh, charged uh, uh, in, in relation to some tweets they have sent out, you know. Um, so, um, so, so that, uh, and also on the other hand, um, the forces of the state have um, huge control over social media and huge armies of people working for them, you know, literally a very organized effort 
to send out tweets uh, in favor of you know the regime uh, to send out tweets in favor of the leadership um, and this is I mean this is actually a super super organized I mean literally it's 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 not something that's just happening it's been it's been pre-planned and organized and there's you know a really great book called I am a troll um, uh, which which documents this um, and um, uh, yeah, so uh, in in and WhatsApp as well, people are very wary because now you know there are there's a there's a corporation, a, a, a multinational corporation, which has basically taken control over over WhatsApp, uh, and uh, who is completely embedded with um, with with the Indian with the Indian state. So um, yeah, uh, so far I guess the situation is not um, like China. Um, but um, yeah, I, as far as I kind of can see, um, people are people are very 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 nervous of you know having uh, having what they say having having these spaces um, uh, uh, yeah off you know on, offline or, or online or off you know. Um, Using 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 the media or using the spaces you know we are doing right now. Thank you, thank you, Jackie, for your question and, and Alpa for for your reaction to that. Uh, Sergey Kopov from Higher School of Economics in Saint Petersburg. Uh, Alpa, thank you very much. Uh, I uh, wanted to ask you, how can we uh, find a way to uh, not uh, make, as you say, uh, uh, research grants buy out your time for writing books like this. Uh, do you think it's important uh, for political theorists or political anthropologists like yourself to write uh, for wider public uh, rather than to, to the peers? What, what can be done uh, 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 to, to make them publish in a, in a broader sense uh, and um, how can we get out of this cocoon when we when we are assigned to publish only among the higher you know how high rating uh, peer journals basically uh, living living us out of uh, of real life in that sense? Thank you. Yeah. Um, again, it's just that's uh, it's such a difficult question. So I think we have to recognize people's like different stages of people's careers. Uh, um, I mean, for me, um, for, for me, what happened is, I'll tell you my story. So my, I, I, um, I, when I came out of the field work, um, actually, I wanted to write a book as fast as possible, right? I wanted to um, basically say that these guys, because the repression was so uh, aggressive in those forests, and everybody I knew was either being arrested or killed. And uh, so it felt really important to um, write about how these guys are not terrorists uh, and, uh, you know, write a book as fast as possible for as wide a public as possible. Um, and then um, I realized that if I did that, um, actually, uh, I would uh, end up um, reproducing uh, some of the binaries uh, around the Naxalites and um, the Adivasis that had that were very prevalent uh, already in in the Indian media, um, uh, and uh, you know I would I would romanticize uh, the revolutionaries. I would romanticize the Adivasis, um, and you know there were various books that were already doing that. And my story was much more complex. You know, it was a story of how different kinds of people were coming together, all the contradictions of how they were falling apart. It's a very very beautiful and a tragic story. Um, uh, and so um, what I decided is that I needed like distance. And in order to do that, I actually wrote loads of academic articles uh, because I, I kind of needed to theorize um, what I had seen in order to be able to live in it again. Um, you know, because uh, what was, um, yeah, to work out, you know, to work out my analysis. So for me, writing the academic articles were actually strangely kind of quite important. Um, um, and so I must have written, I can't remember how many, 10 or 11, you know, academic articles, some of them in, you know, some of the top like journals of my 
field or other fields. And, um, but then when it came to writing the book, then I knew that, you know, the moral, from the beginning, the moral burden that this story couldn't be a story just for my peers. It had to be a scholarly book, but a book that was accessible to a much wider audience. And that was my kind of moral responsibility, you know, in writing, in writing Night March in the way I did. And so I set about writing what I thought, uh, you know, the book I wanted to write. And it took a long, long time to work it out, um, to make it readable, but at the same time, not kind of dumbing down, you know, the scholarship for a wider audience. Because I think, you know, there are two routes. One is like, you can, you can tell stories in a more dumbed down way to make it accessible to a public. But for me, the challenge was to tell the complications, the sophistications of what was going on to, to a wider public. And um, so I managed to do that. And I, the book was published by a trade press uh, as a trade book in the UK and in India, but it was published in the US by an academic press who actually had it peer reviewed. <laughs> um, uh, you know, um, so in, in a way, a book like that, like kind of qualified for two different, you know, um, two different kind of audiences. But for me, the, the, the purpose was that it wasn't going to be just for, for, for an academic audience. So um, I think that funnily enough, there is actually space to do that. The space is kind of increasing to do that as you have more books like Night March. You know, my colleague, David Graeber, you know, who, who's just um, uh, sadly, you know, um, uh, left this world a few weeks ago, you know, he did a lot to make, you know, scholarly ideas um, accessible to much wider publics, you know, and, um, and so there are people, you know, there, there is a kind of, there is, I think, a space opening up. And funnily, it's actually being promoted in a way by the neoliberalization of publishing uh, in a strange way, you know, because to do that, you actually have to go with a trade press, you know, and you to do that, you know, you so the editors who saw Night March, like, the, you know, the, 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 the first version of it, you know, they, there were many people who were interested, and they all said, no, no, you know, we want your story, we want to know more about you, you know, we want to know, you know, we want you so in, in much more of you. And I resisted that because I, this was not a book about me, you know, the, I was there in the story so that you could get to know all the characters, but um, the book was not about me, you know, the book, I was a means for you to get to know, you know, the story of the Naxites, the story of these people. So I was a kind of device in the book. And that was super, super important for me and to keep, you know, to keep to that. Um, so uh, I think that when you try to do something like this, there are pressures from many sides. On the one hand, there's the pressures from academia to not write in this way. On the other hand, there's the pressures from trade presses to make, make it much more about, you know, you or a story that is going to kind of sell, so to speak. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, uh, there's a lot to kind of uh, uh, navigate there. But when... Um, I, you know, so there's no kind of, I guess, one, uh, one way to do this, but, um, uh, and, you know, different stories are for different audiences as well. So, you know, right, doing something for the radio, like I made a little documentary for the radio that was for a kind of very different kind of audience. So you can, you know, I think we have the possibility, those of us who are in academia to use different mediums for different purposes and uh, finding a way to try to do, you know, multiple things at the same time, but always remembering that, you know, we can't just be producing academic knowledge for academia. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Sergey, for your question and Alpa for this, for going in exactly into the heart of, of these questions that we are trying to ask here as part of post-university of how to do this differently and how to do this in a, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a morally responsible way. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time and we have to end this lunch. Uh, but thank you so, so much, Alpa, for, for agreeing to be with us here today. Uh, and uh, uh, I hope, I wish you all the best with, uh, with uh, the, the, the paperback edition of Night March. And I truly hope that, that more people will read it and more people will get inspired, inspired just, like, just like I was inspired after reading your book. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you I, so, I would yeah. like... Yeah. It's so nice Please. to...
so nice to meet you all. Um, it's so nice to be involved in what you're doing here. And uh, yeah, I um, I really appreciate you know the um, your effort to involve me and to share this story. And all power to all of you. Thank you, thank you, Alba. I would just like to mention that uh, we still have uh, th three panels today that will dis discuss and debate on different various topics related to post-university and the future of education. One of those panels is going to be in Russian uh, and we will finish today by, uh, by uh, hosting a discussion between uh, OFF University, which is a Turkish initiative, a Turkish-German initiative uh, uh, that is trying to create alternative knowledge and anti-university from Moscow. You're, you're all very welcome to join. Thank you everyone and uh, goodbye. <laughs>